Mark, how common is uh, sclerosing mesenteritis and, and um, uh, what's, what's the prevalence of this disorder? Yeah. You know, it's surprising. It, 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 back in the past, it seemed very rare. And now that we do CTs on, it seems like almost everybody, somewhere between uh, 0.6 and 1% of all CTs will have something that falls into this category, either misty mesentery or frank sclerosing mesenteritis. So another name for this is uh, mesenteric paniculitis. So uh, you may see that as well, but it's, it's, it's out there. And as clinicians, we get referred to these patients all the time. I think there's been some confusion about nomenclature and um, yes. different names for this disorder. Um, can you talk about that and, and kind of yeah, the of, of the nomenclature? Yeah, it's it, it's been called retractal mesenteritis, mesenteric paniculitis, sclerosing mesenteritis. Um, we'll see, you'll see misty mesentery, which is something short of this, or or basically one one of the features of it. And there are a bunch of others in the literature. We we tried to kind of pare this down and make it simpler. The the general consensus now is that it's called sclerosing mesenteritis and but, uh, but I think you'll hear both sclerosing mesenteritis and mesenteric paniculitis kind of interchangeably. And um, what are some diagnostic criteria that um, are important for gastroenterologists to know yeah. about sclerosing mesenteritis? Yeah. So there, there was a radiologist named Coolier who came up with these criteria. And it's actually something I've been teaching our fellows how to read their own CTs, because what you'll get often is a CT report where they don't know these criteria, but they'll say something like misty mesentery, for example, and that gets clinicians kind of anxious. Um, the diagnostic criteria are um, basically an inflammatory mass in the, um, in the mesentery. It's got to have a higher density than the surrounding uh, mesentery. Um, some of the other features can include, and you only need three of, out of five of these to make a diagnosis, um, a halo sign around the central vessels, which is important because that's often lost in cancers that complicate uh, uh, this condition, which is, fortunately is rare. Um, it can have a pseudocapsule around it, and it can also have small nodes. And the nodes really to be um, diagnostic have to be a centimeter or less. Once the nodes start getting bigger, then you start worrying about, gee, is this a lymphoma or something I have to do something about? You can make the diagnosis on CT. You don't need a biopsy. If it fits the criteria and there are no alarm features, you can you can diagnose on CT scan and start treating if you need to. Hmm. Well, that's great because I think that is one of the clinical questions. Do I need to send this patient for a biopsy, you know, based on these findings? Which, who are the patients uh, with this condition who who need need treatment? Is it, you know, all all 1% of the people who, who have no, this on no. their CT scans no. or, or which yeah, of the It's less than one in 500 that, um, that need the treatment uh, or that need something. Uh, if the nodes are enlarged, um, if you get to the point where you need a PET scan, uh, there, there are nodes that have an uptake of uh, SUV max of greater than three, or they have signs that this is an invasive condition. In other words, if it looks like it's invading the bowel, if it looks like it's retracting the bowel, if there are calcifications, um, if it's associated with another autoimmune disease. Um, now, I will say that sometimes it looks like that, and it's it's an IgG4-related disease. Well, as you know from your practice, IgG4-related conditions typically respond very well to steroids. So uh, mm -hmm. even though it may look worse and you may get to the point where you have to biopsy it uh, because of that behavior, uh, you may find that, gee, this is something perfectly treatable. How about those patients who do merit treatment? Can you talk a little bit about that, the, the treatment armamentarium for this yeah. disorder? And Yeah, and, um, and we've outlined this in the CPU. And, you know, as you know, that, you know, there are not great studies on this. A lot of these are at the case report level. Um, the initial treatment traditionally has been um, prednisone and tamoxifen. Uh, women of, uh, of childbearing age will have trouble with that. Uh, so there are some issues there. So we've kind of laid out how you can go at this. There's another uh, series that should suggest that uh, colchicine and, and prednisone might work. And then basically any of the drugs that we use for inflammatory bowel disease seem to have activity. 